Right, welcome to the uh, MQ stream. This is session 1 a.m. and uh, please leave feedback after after the talk. It's very valuable to us. Um, you have the chat room to ask questions, which Jamie will pick up at the end of his uh, talk. And so over to you. OK, thank you very much. So welcome, everyone. Um, me and my name is Jamie Squibb. I'm one of the development leads for MQ in the um, IBM lab in the UK. So in, in this session, we're going to talk about um, what's new in MQ, um, some of the various industry trends that we're seeing and things that are influencing um, how we are um, enhancing the product. Um, this is actually one of a couple of related sessions about what's new. So in this session, we're going to talk about the general family-wide enhancements to MQ across all the platforms. And then following this session, um, after a short break, um, one of my colleagues, Matt Lemming, is going to talk about um, what's new and more focus more on the actual ZOS platform itself. So there's kind of like two sessions that you, um, you might want to kind of like watch back to back all together to kind of get the complete picture of what's happening in MQ. Okay, so um, so really messaging is um coming more and more essential um in today's world. Everything's becoming more and more connected. Um, we need to build more and more responsive applications for to give users rich experiences. We need to be able to pull on data from various different sources. And really, MQ is kind of focusing on making sure that you can actually connect all these different applications together to build the um the experiences and business um processes that you need in your organization. Um, be it from like small devices all the way through to kind of like your traditional back-end systems, either on-prem or in cloud. So we see really four main kind of themes um, around what's happening. So the, the first one is um, developer agility is becoming more and more important. And this is where rather than having traditional teams, maybe in your infrastructure groups, um, managing the entire estate, we're seeing more and more delivery teams in lines of business being um, empowered and, and asked to actually do the, um, make the changes they need um, themselves and, and kind of pull in al almost automation and, and operations themselves to better react quickly to, to changing market needs. We're also seeing that rather than systems being hosted purely on premise in data centers, that actually more and more applications are being deployed in, in different cloud environments, take advantage of different services that may be there, different capabilities in different environments, and to be able to provide the kind of like the rich experience that we need for whatever the application is. Um, alongside all this, we're seeing that the, um, the traditional kind of teams that look after middleware are being asked to um, challenge to kind of like simplify their management, make cost savings, automate changes, do things such as like, um, having configuration as code to be able to um, avoid manual changes to things which maybe take longer, maybe more prone to errors, and, and being able to ensure that you can actually respond to changes um, as quick as, need, as possible, be it from the business directly or from different um, developer teams that are kind of requesting support within the organization. And then finally, we're also then seeing um, some organic growth, which is really where applications that have been around for a long time maybe and maybe that are mature but you need to now scale them up to support different demands maybe you've exposed traditional applications to mobile front ends where you've got greater demand from users um, and also um, improved security and availability all becoming different aspects that we need to consider for both new applications and traditional ones that have been around for some time. Um, and these four um, different kind of aspects are really kind of like supporting transformation in your organization, but they also are influencing how we actually choose to enhance MQ itself as a product to make sure that it can continue to satisfy your needs. Um, one of the other things that we, um, we obviously get asked about time to time is around um, cloud native. If you're going to clouds, sometimes there's the, um, the assumption that you need to take new technologies to, um, that have been basically been developed since cloud became, became more relevant in, in the world. But actually, <clears throat> cloud native is really more around um, a set of capabilities um, that products can actually um, take advantage of to allow you to manage your infrastructure in the way that you need, um, be it defining services um, in, in a quick, easy way, um, having infrastructure that you declare, exposing APIs, um, using containers, to build resilient and highly available systems. 
And um, an MQ is really focusing around a lot of these um, capabilities to make sure that we actually can fit natively in this environment and actually are, are kind of like are good for that. And, and we've, there's a lot of capabilities in the product that actually fit in with this. So it's, um, so we're, it's one of our kind of like areas of focus to make sure that we continue to evolve to, to kind of fit in this space as it, as it grows over time. So one of the customer use cases that, um, that we've had, and I'm just showing you what sort of things you can do with MQ now, is that you can build automation pipelines for your, for your queue managers, so you can deploy updates or new queue managers in, um, in, quick, in quick periods of time. So for example, um, one scenario that customers had, you can deploy um, MQ queue managers out in a matter of minutes. You can roll out new updates in a, in a matter of days by building pipelines that automatically install updates on all your systems, restart containers if that's what you're using. And by using multiple queue managers to serve your applications, you can do all this without any downtime at all for your applications. So if we look at um, how MQ has been um, evolving, um, hopefully the, um, you're familiar with this because it's something that we've used for a number of years, but we actually have in, um, two variants of MQ that you can consume. We have um, something called a long-term support release, which is our traditional model, whereby you, we provide a new release approximately every couple of years, and then we provide corrective maintenance and, and fixes on that release via um, individual fixes or fix packs or um, so forth, um, to allow you to actually kind of like build up um, and maintain a stable environment whilst also getting the kind of like the fixes in, that you need but you do not have functional enhancements on that long-term support release after it's been released. And this gives you the stability that you might need for, for the most critical systems that you have. Um, but then we also have something called a continuous delivery release, whereby we make available functional enhancements every three to four months or so. And this allows you to take advantage of new features that maybe are, um, that you want to exploit in either specific environments, or of course you can choose to use the continuous delivery release across your entire estate if, if you so wish. Um, the continuous delivery releases are supported for, um, for 12 months because the intent is that you will continue to keep taking those updates um, as you need to as we release them over time. Um, so it might be that you, you use long-term support release for, for your main estate, but certain applications that you want to use new features for, you can adopt the CD releases, you keep updating them, and then maybe when the functions are available in a new long-term support release, maybe you switch those back to that, or maybe you continue to take further updates that we've made available as you need to. Um, you can definitely mix and match these, you do not have to have that all of your queue managers or infrastructure um, using one release or the other, you can use them as you see fit based on the needs. So the latest long-term support release that we have is um, 9.2, um, and we've had um, a couple, three CD updates since then, with the most recent being um, 9.2.3, and we're now going to talk about various updates that have been made into that long-term support release, and also some more recent ones um, through the continuous delivery stream. Um, just to give you a flavour for some of the enhancements, I'm clearly not going to go through them all, um, but we are in continually involved, um, adding new enhancements all the time to the product, and this is just a flavour of the, the volume and number of changes that we made to the, to the MQ product between 9.1 and 9.2 long-term support releases. Um, so there's, there's plenty there, and we're trying to um, address all those different aspects I mentioned um, in terms of the, the different kind of themes that we're seeing in, in the industry. Um, and since the long-term support release, we've also um, been continuing to make a number of updates, and some of these that we're going to talk about um, in the rest of this session. So before, before we do that, it's also just worth mentioning that MQ continues to focus on being available wherever you need it. Um, one of the main um, values of MQ has been that it's available in all the different environments and it allows you to connect your, your systems together wherever you choose to run them. <clears throat> Traditionally, that's been in different, um, different platforms hosted in data centers, be it on Windows or Unix, Linux or IBM Z. Um, We've also got the MQ appliance that's been available since 2015, which is a dedicated hardware offering which hosts queue managers, almost like an MQ hub in a box that you can plug into your data centers and configure with minimal overhead. <clears throat> but we also are, have been focusing on ensuring that you can run MQ 
in, in clouds, be it either in VMs or in containers, um, either in um, cloud deployments yourself, or you can use the IBM managed service where IBM will um, host your queue managers for you, either in the IBM cloud or in AWS. Um, Red Hat OpenShift is um, one of IBM's strategic platforms. So, so this is really where um, we're looking to provide um, lots of support for ensuring that you can deploy MQ in a, in a seamless and, and well-managed way using that, that environment. So if we look at MQ and containers, there's, there's a few things that it's, it's worth looking at. So the first is, is that containers are really designed to be kind of light, lightweight, easy to, easy to deploy. So MQ is really designed to be run in this way. You can actually run queue managers with, with very little resources allocated to them um, based on, on your needs. Obviously, you can grow them based on, on what you need as well. <clears throat> um, MQ has really been um, designed from its outset many years ago to be loosely coupled, which fits well with the, um, the cloud environments where you want to build networks of, of different systems all connected together, um, basically being deployed in, in different locations. Um, you can use MQ clustering to allow you to kind of simplify the routing of messages between those different queue managers as you build environments that provide availability and scalability. And at the same time, um, we have a number of um, features in the product that allow you to build resiliency into your your queue manager estate, um, <clears throat> either by using um, shared storage or disk replication or, <clears throat> or other technologies and that actually allow us to ensure that we can have rapid takeover of, of, a, of a queue manager instance and restart it elsewhere if, if you need to based on, on kind of outages or maintenance windows. <clears throat> and finally, um, as I say, with, um, with the OpenShift platform, um, we're also now seeing um, <clears throat> The ability to kind of like integrate MQ with, with other offerings such as um, within our cloud pack for integration. So you can actually take all of IBM's integration suite and deploy it in a flexible way, um, spinning up various different containers that you need to based on your needs at any one time and taking advantage of the operators to simplify your management experience of, of those systems. <clears throat> So looking into the cloud pack for integration, as I say, this is really um, IBM's strategic focus as a, as a platform. So cloud pack for integration really kind of fits into this OpenShift world. Um, you can build your own containers for MQ based on um, those templates that we make available. And that's, that's obviously fully supported. Um, we also provide a certified container that is designed to work in, in the OpenShift environment. And this is really where you can download the, the image and you'll get full support on the MQ product in that container, but also the container image itself as well. And it's designed to work well with the, um, the operator that we make available to kind of really simplify your experience. So you can, you can make deployments very quickly, um, deploy rolling updates by just specifying to the operator that you want to use a different version, and then the operator will deal with ensuring that that, that rollout occurs for you. Um, in the cloud pack, you can obviously have other integration aspects, so you can have centralized logging and tracing for both MQ and your other integration um, products. And the licensing model is such that you can actually continue to use your existing systems and um, potentially maybe as you decide to kind of transition into, into containers within the OpenShift world, if, if that's what you need. Um, so there's, a, there's a, is obviously a summary of various positioning. Um, obviously, this is now what's new session. So we're now just going to kind of go through some of the new features that we've had in the product and really look to see um, how they address some of those needs and, and, fit and align with, um, with those different um, trends. So if we look at a message availability, this is really around ensuring that you can, um, you can always get access to the messages that are held on queues in a queue manager. And we have a number of HA capabilities in the product that we've developed over time that allow you to, to achieve this. Um, on the ZOS platform, you have um, queue showing groups, which really is the, kind of like the premier HA offering, um, which gives you kind of like the best availability that you can have by actually having multiple queue managers um, being able to access the same messages that are stored in the coupling facility. Um, if we look at other platforms, then there are various other techniques you can use based on either third parties to um, products to use system managed HA. You can use our multi-instance queue managers um, that use kind of shared network storage <clears throat> to, to build resiliency. 
Um, we have the energy appliance I mentioned, which uses um, software replication to replicate the data synchronously between two instances um, and using kind of like heart beating between those two appliances to have automatic failover of queue managers from one appliance to the other. And then we that that model of using replication rather than shared network storage was um was very attractive to a number of customers, <clears throat> but not everybody wants to use a, a physical appliance. So we then built what, a feature called replicated data queue managers, which provide an equivalent capability on on Linux. Um, and as this diagram illustrates, as we kind of move over um from left to right, the, the kind of like the dependencies or the environment constraints that you have tend to reduce over time sort of thing so therefore the um it's much easier to deploy something like um replicated data queue managers in vms in different environments um you can do that in the cloud or on-prem versus obviously queue sharing groups being very much specific to to the Zeros platform itself so if we look at replicated data queue managers which is um <clears throat> something that obviously i was just discussing um this is a solution that is based on red hat linux um it's part of the mq advanced product and you build up a, a, an, an environment which has a number of standard Linux hosts with just standard lin local Linux storage associated with them. And you can configure um, an, a high availability group with, with three nodes. And the data is then synchronously replicated between those nodes. And you can have automatic failover of a queue manager instance from one of the nodes to the other based on your needs, either for rolling maintenance or outages. So in this example, um, the queue manager is running on node one, um, the data is being synchronously replicated to nodes two and three. And if, um, if there was an issue with node one, or you needed to take it down for maintenance, the queue manager can be automatically started on nodes two and three, and it's got access to all the same data that it, that it had on node one because of that synchronous replication. Um, all that's required is that the queue manager needs to be restarted and go through kind of like startup processing, and then it's open for business um, for your applications. Um, you can configure an IP address to kind of float with that queue manager so that the, um, the applications still use the same logical endpoint to connect to the queue manager, irrespective of which node it's running on. Um, and then as, as is shown in the diagram, you can also actually pair that with a, a second high availability group at a, a second location. Um, be it for the disaster recovery, and you can have asynchronous replication of the data between those two groups. So you can have high availability, automatic failover, synchronous replication within sites, but then you can also have a failover to a second site um, if you have a if you have a disaster. <clears throat> and this really then gives you the flexibility of having um, quite resilient access to your messages, um, both for um, system outages and also site outages in your in your environment. <clears throat> We've also been spending quite a lot of time on focusing at the, the, the kind of like the startup times for queue managers, because as well as actually allowing you to have that resiliency with these HA techniques, um, they generally all require a queue manager restart um, at, the, at the new location where it's going to be run. And so we want to make sure that that can be as optimal as possible. Um, and going back um, a while now in the 9.1 release, we actually spent quite a lot of time in focusing on improving restart times, both for, for planned outages and also for kind of like abrupt failures where you need to kind of restart and perform recovery um, during restart. Um, <clears throat> and we've really got that down to be um, really a, a matter of um, seconds, if, if not less than that, um, which is allows you to get your business operational again as fast as you can. So having looked at that, um, one of the other things that we've been focusing on is making sure that we can provide all of these HA features um, capabilities that you need in the environments that you need. Um, if we look specifically at cloud environments, then some of those um, features that I've just discussed aren't necessarily um, as applicable. So um, if you want to deploy <clears throat> containers in a, um, in, a, in a cloud environment, such as um, IBM Cloud or AWS, then queue sharing groups, the appliance and replicated data queue managers aren't so applicable because of either the environment they run in or the fact that they are um, specific to kind of like virtual machines rather than containers. Um, replicated data queue managers uses kind of interacts with the Linux kernel, so it doesn't, it doesn't really fit in a container world. So the options that were left were prior to the um, enhancement that we've made were around using shared file system storage, which can be, can be awkward to, to kind of manage. 
So we've actually taken the, the, the concepts of using replication and we've built in a new feature um, into MQ called native HA. Um, native H, we're calling it native HA because it, it fits in with the, um, the kind of like the, the cloud native world and it's built into MQ itself. So it doesn't need any external components that we might use in for either replicated data queue managers or shared network storage or things like that. So the native HA product is, is very similar to the RDQM pattern in terms of it has three instances. Um, the queue manager is active in, in one of those instances and the other two are, are standby replicas. Um, rather than performing replication at the disk storage level, which is what um, the RDQM and the appliance do, um, the native HA feature actually replicates the queue manager recovery log um, between the, the different instances. So we, that way we can optimize what we're replicating. So we don't need to unnecessarily replicate um, data that relates to non-persistent messages. Um, we can replicate just what we need to allow the, the queue manager to, to restart at the at one of the other nodes with the data it needs to maintain your persistent messaging workloads. <clears throat> so you have exactly um, three nodes. Um, and if, if one fails, then the, 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 the actual native HA solution will, will pick one of the other replicas to take over in the same way that you might be familiar with other, other technologies that use leader follower patterns. Um, it uses a quorum technique to ensure that we don't have the queue manager active in two instances at the same time. So they will coordinate and if, and if all the instances were to become isolated, then the queue manager will end until um, a majority can be formed by connected nodes. So this, this really protects the integrity of your data whilst also ensuring high availability and automatic takeover of, um, of instances in response to maintenance or outages. Um, native HA is, is kind of geared up for the cloud pack for integration environment at the moment. And we are aware that <clears> the <throat> customers have expressed interest in having it available elsewhere. Um, but at the moment for 923, it's, it's focused on the open shift world in, in cloud pack for integration. And the MQ operator that is available in that environment has been updated to ensure that it can allow you to seamlessly manage your native HA deployments. It can actually spin up the containers for you, um, perform rolling maintenance with that, um, a, few, a few kind of um, updates that you might need to make to do that. And it will maintain and ensure that you always have the number of instances available that you need for, for your service. So if we look at some of the other features in, in MQ around, so one of the other things that we did um, in the recent, recent past is add a feature called uniform clusters. So MQ supported clusters for, for many years. Um, and this is really a pattern that we, we saw evolving in the industry. So this is really where you've got a number of queue manager instances that provide, um, that collectively provide a service for um, one or a set of applications. Each queue manager is essentially a clone of the other queue managers in the cluster. They all have the host the same queues um, and are really used to provide scalability and workload balancing of your application messages. Um, some of the challenges that we saw the customers facing when trying to establish this sort of configuration was really around making sure that applications were evenly distributed across their queue manager instances, ensuring that um, if queue managers were added or removed from the cluster, based on scaling needs that the applications were, were, were adjusting to, to kind of like the new configuration. And so we built into the MQ product um, some awareness at the queue manager level of where the applications are and, where, um, <clears throat> and how many are connected throughout the cluster. And with this capability, we can now actually um, dynamically request that applications reconnect to another queue manager in the cluster to ensure even balancing um, of, of those different services to make sure that all the applications aren't necessarily skewed towards a one or two of the queue managers and maybe a queue manager's not got any applications connected to it. We can dynamically move applications and request them to, to connect using, um, using, by using kind of like different aspects in, in, our, in our kind of client queue manager protocol. Um, this, this works by applications connecting over the network and using CCDTs and we can obviously um, we can kind of like to just allow them to work out where to connect to. Um, and obviously we can discuss that later in the presentation. Um, 
one of the, um, the things that we've done in the 923 release, if you're familiar with uniform clusters already, is that we've added support um, for um, MDB applications um, in kind of like message driven beans to be able to take advantage of this. So you can actually have your, um, your JEE environments um, connecting to uniform clusters and being dynamically balanced across the queue manager instances um, based on, on, on your workload balancing needs. So in terms of applications, obviously we, we want to make sure that we're continuing to enhance the product for developers as, as well as obviously system administrators. <clears throat> so one of the things that we've done um, for the container environment, um, particularly Kubernetes, is, is that we've, um, we've added support for MQ into um, something called KEDA. Um, so KEDA is um, kind of a Kubernetes event-driven auto-scaling framework. And we've provided a kind of a sample online that allows you to, um, to see how you can dynamically add or remove um, instances of your queue managers um, <clears throat> in, in the kind of like the um, container world based on the depths of it. So you can actually um, spin up different levels of applications in your world based on the, the depths of, um, of messages that you might have on the queues. So therefore you can process those messages in an optimal way based on the kind of like the workload that's flowing, flowing through those queues itself. So, um, so if if you can if you see that the queue is growing, you can HEDA can automatically um, spin up additional instances of your applications to allow you to to process that workload. And then once the depth of the queues then drops back down to a kind of like a more normal level, you can then um, kind of like close some of those application instances down and return back to your normal steady state. And it allows you to do this automatically rather than you needing to use manual intervention to achieve this. Um, We've also been focusing on making available um, developer resources to allow um, to allow you to build your own applications in the various language environments that you need. Um, <clears throat> lots of different samples and patterns that allow you to quickly develop applications so you can focus on the business needs rather than the specifics of how to get um, messaging working in your environment. So we've we've made available various patterns that are available that you can you can use as templates on. Um, on our Git repo, we've also got an IBM developer site which provides tutorials and walkthroughs on how you can actually um, build build the systems that you need. And there's also a digital badge that you can you can use to ensure that people have a, a basic level of understanding of messaging in MQ um, as a, as a kind of like a benchmark within your organisation if, if you so wish to to do so. In terms of helping developers um, work, um, increasingly we see that um, the developers just want to use the tools natively where they are rather than have to go off and get different, different components from different locations. So um, in terms of how can you build applications such as um, <clears throat> Java or .NET, we've actually made available the MQ client libraries in the repositories that those developers would typically want to use, such as Maven um, or NuGet for, for Java and .NET respectively. This means that um, various developer environments that can be configured to automatically pull these libraries and dependencies down um, can do so um, in a natural way for those developers rather than having to go off and separately install um, MQ and download it from, from an IBM location. Um, we also see that um, there's a, a concept called async API that's kind of evolving whereby similar to how you might have your own APIs for, for various synchronous workloads, um, the async API allows you to define the endpoints that application developers might choose to use for, for messaging or other asynchronous operations. And so we've actually provided um, some bindings, some bindings available that allow you to see how you can define MQ endpoints for your application developers to use to actually allow them to kind of like <clears throat> Go to central locations to find out where the endpoints are and how they can connect to them rather than having to contact different specific teams in your organization to find that information out. We've also been focusing on ensuring that the applications continue to be able to exploit the protocols and APIs that they need. So MQ has had its own um, proprietary MQI interface for, for, for many, many years. And um, we've also supported um, MQTT for kind of like telemetry applications. <clears throat> um, but over the last few years, we've also been focusing on allowing um, you to use other interfaces such as REST 
um, for, for lightweight applications that just want to be able to call an HTTP endpoint. Very, very suitable if you don't have an MQ client available in that environment, or you just need to be able to send or receive messages quickly without maybe some of the other qualities of service that you might get from a, from a richer client library. Um, <clears throat> but we also see that the clients want to be able to use other, other kind of technologies as well, such as AMQP or Apache Cupid. Um, and so we've been building um, support for, for MQ in, into these environments and client environments so that you can actually take advantage of those in, in the applications that you need. So you can now fully use Apache Cupid JMS um, to talk to an MQ queue manager in the same way that you might for, for other messaging technologies. So one of the other um, enhancements that we've made into the product recently is around allowing you to improve the insight to your data. <clears throat> and this is something that we're called um, streaming queues. So um, some of the challenges that customers have had over, over several years is really around making sure that you can understand what's happening in your environment, what messages are flowing through. Um, <clears throat> this might be to um, allow you to build auditing environments so that you can make sure you can maintain audit trails of, of different workloads that have, are occurring. Um, maybe you want to be able to build and gather samples of real world data for your test environments, or, or maybe you want to use it for kind of like um, training um, AI applications or things like that. Um, and similarly, you might want to be able to get, just gain other general insights and, and stream the, the data that's being processed by applications out to, to other techniques to gain, to gain kind of like insight into either your customers to build richer experience and things like that. <clears throat> so, one of the features that we've added is called streaming queues. And this is where you can actually configure MQ to place a, an exact kind of copy of the message on a second queue whilst it's, when it's been put to your main queue applications are using. <clears throat> so in this example, um, the application is putting a message onto the queue. The original message is made available for the uh, application on the right to process. But at the same time, a copy of that message is made available on a second queue that can then be consumed for, for other purposes based on, on what you want to process those, that data for. So maybe this is for the audit trail or for consuming into, into other environments for data mining or, or other things like that. And this is all kind of completely transparent to the applications. It's all configured on the, um, on the, on the queue manager side. And you can choose to um, ensure that the message is either guaranteed to be written to that streaming queue or it's done on a best can do basis. So, for example, if the if the message can't be put to the streaming queue because maybe it's it's become full, you can you can either allow the original message to be processed as per before, or you can actually prevent that message from being put to the, the original queue as well to ensure that you can guarantee to have um, a complete copy of that data on, on that streaming location. So there's various flexibility there based on, on what you need to use it for. Um, <clears throat> one of, um, we have seen over the years that customers have tried to do this using publish subscribe, um, but actually that doesn't guarantee to maintain all of the different fields of the messages correctly in terms of message IDs and so forth, because um, so, but this technology maintains all those different attributes exactly because the message is a, is as near a duplicate as we can, we can possibly achieve. So some, some other things to, to think about are um, <clears throat> with, the, with the growing um, deployments of, of MQ, um, either across different availability regions or different geographical regions, um, we see that um, data can have to be transmitted over either large distances um, with, with, low latent, with um, high latencies um, or maybe less reliable networks that are maybe not so, so ideal as what you might have within your data centers. And so one of the features in the integration portfolio that we have is called a spare. And a spare is really around optimizing um, kind of the, the transfer of data over, over large distances with, um, with, with poor network quality. And so you can actually use the Aspera gateway um, to provide an optimal um, channel for your data to be flowed between queue managers in this environment. So you can have <clears throat> um, your, your messages coming out of your queue manager channels going through the Aspera gateway until they get to the queue manager at the other end. And you can actually then get a, a much more optimal um, transfer of the data than just using raw TCP IP between the queue managers. 
Um, and the diagram on the on the right illustrates some of the um, the throughput gains that you can get based on on certain latencies and packet loss that you might have in the networks. And hopefully you can see that um, as the the quality of the network or the latency increases, that you can really gain some significant performance advantages from using this this technology. <clears throat> We've also had a, a, a support pack for many years called Internet Pass-Through. And Internet Pass-Through is really around providing uh, like TLS separation between endpoints, maybe allowing you to kind of flow um, MQ data over um, an HTTP endpoint between, between networks to simplify firewall rules and things like that. <clears throat> and it's been, a, it's been a support pack um, that's been separate from the product. But actually, as we've seen this becoming more and more important for customers in their environments, we've pulled this feature into the main MQ product. So we did this originally in 9.1.4, and it's been that was enrolled into the 9.2 long-term support release. So you can actually now um, have IPT available as part of the main MQ product with all the standard support that you would get from the MQ offering. Um, and then we also enhanced it to allow it to support things like hardware security modules to maintain the certificates that it might need to do for, um, for, that, for that security operations that you, you deploy it for in your environments. And so this is really useful and fits very well in a world where you're transferring data between on-premise and cloud environments or between clouds. You can actually use IPT to provide additional security for, for your endpoints and, and isolate those environments to based on, on your kind of like security needs. So in terms of um, managing MQ and some of the other features that we've added into it. So I mentioned that before um, <clears throat> we're seeing needs to kind of like reduce costs and improve automation by taking advantage of scripts to ensure that everything can be done achievably repeatedly um, and have multiple instances rolled out very quickly. And so we've actually been adding features into the product to allow you to kind of like um, do this more efficiently. So um, the first thing is around um, scripting itself. So the submitting MQSC commands to queue managers can either be done locally or you can actually use the, the run MQSC client application to connect to queue managers over a, a channel connection. And therefore you can run um, commands against queue managers um, that are located in different endpoints or different nodes from a central location based on your orchestration needs. We've made some enhancements to MQSC commands so that they can be now more idempotent. Um, that means that if you run the command repeatedly multiple times, it has the same effect as if you just run the command once. Um, and things allow simple things to like allowing you to actually deal with the kind of like the return codes of trying to delete a queue that no longer exists. Rather than getting an error, if, it, if you've already deleted it, you can say that I just want to know that the queue is no longer there. And that really helps you define what you want your estate to look like rather than without worrying about so much about how it looked to start with. Um, <clears throat> we've also been um, allowing you to, I made updates to allow you to pull um, and run in QSC when the queue manager starts. So you can actually deploy the configuration that you need with the queue manager and have the queue manager make sure that during startup it pulls in and defines all the objects it needs rather than waiting for the queue manager to become available and then you connect to define those definitions that you need. And, and finally, we've been adding um, REST, REST support to allow you to administer your queue managers over REST in addition to being able to put and receive messages over REST. So we have a messaging API, but also an admin API for REST. And this allows you to um, manipulate your queue managers um, using just standard HTTP connections from different environments that you want to use. Originally, we, we started off creating some bespoke your REST URIs for different types of object, but we, we quickly realized that wasn't the, the best approach to take. So we've, we've now developed a REST API specifically for MQSC command. Um, Initially, this was just a kind of a plain text definition. So you provided the command as a single string to run, um, but then we actually then enhanced it to allow you to specify the actual MQSC command using a structured JSON payload and receive the response back in a, in a similarly structured JSON response. And this allows you to quickly and easily define the, the MQSC command you need identify the attributes you need, build up the commands in a, in a more natural way that, that fits very much with the, the flexible kind of JSON format that, that's available. 
Um, <clears throat> and this is available across all of the platform sets by, um, by sending the REST APIs. We can run it directly on specific local queue managers, or we can even um, use a kind of a gateway feature to route the commands to other queue managers in your network um, based on, on the features in the MQ product. So we, as I say, as, as a, in terms of allowing you to define your, your kind of configuration as, as or code as config and so forth, we can actually also allow you to do this for applications as well. So in addition to having the, um, your NQSC definitions and so forth for your queue managers all defined and allow you to deploy those with your queue managers in an easy way, we've also allowed you to um, do so for your applications in terms of defining the endpoints they connect to. Um, it's generally, um, bad practice to hard code connection information and queue manager names into your applications because that makes it harder for you to scale up to different queue manager instances or root app boots to different locations based on availability. So the um, MQ has a feature called um, CTDTs and CTDTs allow you to kind of like build the um, kind of like a repository of all the connection information that you need your applications to connect to. And then you can then allow your point your applications to that, and they can then pull the information they need rather than having it hard coded in them directly. Um, traditionally, the CCTTs were generated as a kind of a binary object from queue managers, um, but in recent time we've expanded that to allow you to define CCTTs in the JSON format, so you can actually kind of like store the definitions you need in kind of code repositories push those out with your applications as part of orchestration frameworks. And it's a much more natural fit for, for how, how kind of applications are kind of like managed today. Um, and at the same time, we've enhanced the CCDT capabilities to allow you to use, have multiple channels of the same name defined in the same, in the object that fits with the uniform cluster capability that I mentioned, whereby you want to connect to one of a number of queue managers and have each of those queue managers um, looking and feeling the same. Um, in terms of allowing you to build automated pipelines, um, all of these MQ, MQ features allow you to do this based on either having container images that you've built for your MQ deployments um, that you might want to update regularly and push them out yeah. in, to, to kind of like into your state. Um, and using the, um, the OpenShift operator, this really does make it very simple for you because there's a, there's a single kind of like one line that you can change to define um, what image you want to use and then the operator will, will seamlessly go through your estate and update the, the queue manager instances to, to take advantage of the new new image or new version that you want to use. Some other features that we've introduced, um, first one is around um, queue size control. So um, over um, MQ's had um, features that have allowed you to specify the maximum depth of queues or the maximum um, size of a message that you're prepared to store on a queue. Um, but this can make it difficult for, for administrators to really um, manage quotas around their queue managers and, and manage that and con constrain the, the size of a, of a queue can grow to to prevent messages going to one queue impacting those for another. Um, if particularly if you've got messages of varying sizes that are flowing through the same queues, um, if you've got lots of large messages and small messages together it makes it harder for you to use just the maximum depth or the maximum message size directly because you might want to support a large number of smaller messages or a smaller number of larger messages or a combination of both. So um, we've actually added the ability to allow you to define the maximum size that a queue can grow to on the distributed platforms. And this provides a kind of like a an ultimate cap for, for how big an individual queue can grow, which allows you to, to manage the storage allocated to your queue manager um, in a more effective way. Um, at the same time, we also allowed you to um, grow the size of individual queues um, beyond the two terabyte limit that we had before. And this really allows you to um, ensure that you, if you need to have queues acting as a buffer during kind of maintenance windows or outages, that actually they can continue to consume the messages that, and, and store the messages that you need until after the various extended outages that you might, might be incurring. We've been building a, a kind of like a web console as to build um, to help you manage your estate in addition to um, other traditional administrative interfaces such as MQ Explorer. Um, the web console was originally introduced for the appliance as a kind of like a browser-based um, interface into managing the system. 
um, and that quickly expanded to, to cover other platforms as well. Um, over um, the last couple of years, we've, um, IBM's been making a, a concerted effort to standardize the, the UI experience across the entire IBM portfolio. So we've actually been um, re reworked the console to take advantage of those kind of standardization that we're trying to achieve and also kind of bring it a bit more up to date with, with various features. So the console really focuses on, on user experience and consistency across because I mean products to allow your, your, your teams to seamlessly move between products, particularly if, for example, you're using the cloud platform integration with a whole suite of IBM capabilities all built in together. Um, <clears throat> the, the console allows you to, say, manage the queue managers, delve down into the queues, define the various objects that you need. And, and, <clears throat> and traditionally, well, when we first um, introduced it, it was only for, for local queue managers on, on the same host as the, as the console itself hosted as a Liberty environment on that system. But actually we've, we've now made enhancements to it so that you can actually um, connect to queue managers in a remote location. Um, and this really is a, is a very powerful kind of feature because it means you no longer need to install the Liberty server wherever you've got a queue manager. Um, you can actually just have it deployed centrally and then connect to a whole range of remote queue managers in a similar way that you would have done to the um, MQ Explorer um, as an Eclipse framework on, on your own systems. Um, so you can you can restrict um, whether you have local or remote queue managers. Um, so there's various features there to help you kind of define define the kind of like the topology that you need in, in the way that you need. One of the other challenges that we, we saw customers having was around managing cipher specs. Um, increasingly, there's a focus on, on using specific ciphers that are no longer susceptible to particular weaknesses that may have been identified. <clears throat> and historically, MQ has required you to define the specific cipher that you want to use at both ends of the channel connection between the other queue managers or applications. Um, this meant that it, it could become um, quite tricky for you to change the cipher that you use because you have to coordinate the change at both endpoints. Um, if you're using clusters or, or kind of sets of queue managers applications, you have to go through and make the change universally across all of those endpoints at the same time, um, which could be quite difficult for you to kind of like coordinate. So um, we've, in recent time, we've introduced um, some additional cipher specs that essentially allow you to use um, collective suites or sets of ciphers and then MQ will dynamically negotiate the, the cipher that it, that it needs to use based on, on the strongest common cipher between the, end, the endpoints allow in, a, in the same way that you would um, you, you expect to, this, to have work in other environments such as with your browser or other things like that. So, so we have um, cipher specs called such as any TLS saying you want to use any, any TLS um, cipher but not older SSL ciphers or you can say, I want to use any TLS 1.2 or higher, which means that it has to be a TLS 1.2 cipher or stronger to allow you to use it. Um, and then this, and on top of that, you can then also go down and define that you're allowed, you either allow or, or deny specific ciphers in those endpoints um, beyond that additional specification. So that really allows you to have fine grained control of your ciphers and add or remove ciphers to the permitted list um, within your endpoints in a much more seamless way without having to go and make lots of configuration changes throughout your estate to change the cipher that you want to use. And at the same time, we are, we're continuing to expand this, um, and support TLS 1.3 across all the different platforms, languages and protocols in the product. And there's many, many of those um, support TLS 1.3 already. Um, focusing also more on some more on encryption, we can see that um, on the ZOS platform, we, we fully support the um, <clears throat> data set encryption feature that's been available um, for a while now. Um, from MQ 9.1.5, um, you can use data set encryption across all the MQ data sets. Um, prior to that, we restricted the types of data sets that you could use to be in just the archive logs, not the active logs and so forth. But I say from, from 9.1.5 and later, um, you can actually take advantage of it across all the data sets in your, in your ZOS queue manager environments. Um, and this really allows you to kind of like manage and protect your data at rest in the same way that you would do across the other um, um, subsystems on, on the platform. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of complements the, um, the advanced message security feature in MQ, 
which and which because the advanced message security feature provides end-to-end -end encryption and one of the main advantages of that is it and it prevents your administrators from seeing the data of, on the messages as well whereas just disk encryption alone um protects it on the storage device but but in, in the system being operational your admins can, can still access the data that way so we see these kind of complementary you get the, the data set encryption feature to protect all the data at rest as a kind of like a universal policy and then you can use advanced message security um, if you need to to provide additional um, protection for messages as they flow throughout your MQ network um, across different platforms from, from various endpoints that you need to use um, but looking at the advanced message security feature um, you, you you can configure the applications to configure and to, to encrypt or decrypt messages or digitally sign them um, before or uh, before they enter the MQ network or after they leave the MQ network um, within the MQ client libraries. You don't have to make changes to the applications themselves to take advantage of it. It's all within the MQ kind of product. Um, but then we've also um, seen that increasingly we want um, customers to be able to configure environments <clears throat> that apply AMS protections within their own organization, but maybe they need to interact with third parties or business partners that, um, that don't need to have that same requirement. So um, MQ on distributed has always had the ability to allow M the MQ queue managers to provide, um, apply the AMS policies when the messages are received at the queue manager rather than being performed by the application itself. But we've not been able to do this between queue managers in an MQ network. Um, on the ZOS platform, you can actually configure AMS to um, encrypt, decrypt, or sign messages um, at the queue manager to queue manager boundary, um, which really works if, if you're if you get messages coming in from a third party over a sender receiver channel, for example. Um, you can apply the policies that you need on entry to your organization, or you can apply the policies, <clears throat> you can remove the protection you need or add protection going to a third party based on their needs. Um, this is something that's available on the ZOS platform only at the moment. Um, we have and um, we are aware that this is something that um, other customers and other environments would also like. Um, but at the moment, this is um, one of those features that's just, just available on, on ZOS. In terms of um, managed file transfer, this is, a, this is a feature in MQ that allows you to take advantage of the, of the MQ network that you've built up for transferring message data between applications and exploit it to allow you to transfer files between locations um, in a secure and reliable way um, using features to kind of like schedule file transfers, split files up into messages or combine messages to files and so forth. And we've been increasingly adding um, features to, to the MFT product um, component to allow you to have a high availability for the agents that transfer files and also um, enhance the REST APIs that allow you to kind of like monitor and configure the MFT components um, to make it more kind of like fit more into the, um, the other capabilities that we have in the MQ product for, for managing for that, both the compute queue managers as well as the MFT agents. <clears throat> so if we, um, if we look back at some of the original themes that we had for uh, the start of the presentation, we saw that we have um, developer agility is important to allowing teams to kind of like empower, empower the lines of business in, um, teams to make changes they need rather than depending on central teams to perform the work on their behalf. I mean, it allows them to much more rapidly respond to market needs um, and in a way that they, they can actually take advantage of themselves. <clears throat> we can see that um, we want to support different multi-cloud environments so you can connect across data centers and clouds based on wherever you need your applications to need to run and you want your MQ deployments to be as close to applications as possible so that you can take advantage of the different capabilities that are available. We want different organizational teams to be as efficient as possible at managing their infrastructure, um, reduce costs by automating as much as possible and taking advantage of different monitoring features that MQ provides. Um, and then also at the same time, building in additional resiliency, scalability, security to, to both new and existing deployments. <clears throat> and so through the, um, this presentation, we've covered quite a lot of features that kind of address a lot of these different aspects. So we can see that for the developer agility part, we have various resources that are available to allow developers to kind of pull down patterns to allow them to get quickly started. We have 
the different libraries that are available in different repositories that they want to naturally use to build their applications, such as um, Maven and NuGet. And we're building in support, building support to allow them to develop applications for in, in the style that they wish to use, be it REST, um, AMQP, Cupid, um, based on, on the different requirements that they have and the skills they have. In terms of supporting um, multiple cloud environments, we, we, we're focusing very much on, on the Red Hat OpenShift world, but also we have other capabilities into the um, in MQ, such as the internet pass-through feature to allow you to kind of connect between different environments um, based on your deployment needs and ensure that <clears throat> you can move your applications and queue managers to whichever cloud or, or, or kind of data center that you might need to do. In terms of helping operational agility, um, we've talked about various features that allow you to kind of like build auto orchestration into your um, <clears throat> environment using containers or various kind of config as code features that we have to allow you to repeatedly run and perform the same actions um, in, a, in a kind of like a seamless, in a seamless way. And then finally, we've talked about some of the various kind of features that we've been adding to MQ to help you improve um, the availability that you have um, <clears throat> using uniform clusters, um, RDQM or native HA for containers um, in terms of <clears throat> say pairing these features together so that you have resiliency for individual queue managers, but also having a, a set of queue managers that can serve applications for increased resiliency and kind of like avoiding outages during maintenance windows and things like that and um, allowing it to deploy into the environments that you need <clears throat> um, without you having to kind of like make too many adjustments or compromises. So hopefully that's been a kind of like a really um, kind of like useful overview of some of the directions and features we've been adding. Um, as I mentioned before, um, there's a se second session that focuses on lots of the new features that are available in, in the ZOS platform, which my colleague Matt Lemming will be um, presenting um, after a short break. Um, <clears throat> but that's that's really the, the main content that I wanted to kind of cover today. Uh, hopefully you found it useful. Um, I, I don't see any questions in the in the chat, so hopefully it was all kind of clear for you. But um, obviously, if you've got any questions, then um, we've got a few minutes that we can we can we can try and answer them. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was that was excellent. Anybody has any uh, queries? Oh. Uh, please post your feedback, which you can do through your BYOA or um, scan the queue. QR code. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate um, <clears throat> appreciate it. I um, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and you find some other sessions important and, and useful for you. And um, we've got a number of other MQ sessions um, throughout this week and next week. Um, so hopefully um, you'll find those useful as well. Um, focusing on either clustering, on, on security, um, <clears throat> assessing where your messages are within your, in your ZOS environment and so forth. Um, and then we've got a deeper dive on the high availability as, as well and event streaming. So hopefully there's various aspects there, other sessions that you might find useful. So um, hope you hope you enjoy the, the conference. Thank you very much, Jamie.